nav questions. Nā, kā uz evagiem bādīm nīja nav, aizsienkai es arī iekādi diskās evagiem tājiem. Ok, thanks. Ok. Then let's go further. Uh, my name is Dainis. You have noticed me here announcing something and so on. I am representing here uh, the Institute for Environmental Solutions. And uh, today, I, when I was thinking like about what to say, uh, I decided uh, to make the presentation as, uh, as lessons learned while working with Sentinel data. And our experience working with Sentinel data is dating from, I don't know, 2015 or even like earlier and so on. We have uh, done different, uh, different studies and uh, worked on different applications using Sentinel data and I will share uh, some of them and uh, also get give you some kind of advices what to do or what not to do uh, if, if you want to try to do something. And, um, Okay, uh, let's uh, move further and uh, a little bit shortly about uh, our institute. Uh, it's a privately established research and innovation institute. We are located uh, near CSIS uh, in the airfield. Uh, we are combining uh, different disciplines, starting from the technical ones, uh, also covering uh, uh, disciplines uh, like, like uh, expertise in forestry, agriculture, uh, ecology, and, and uh, et cetera. And our two key uh, focus areas which are related uh, to this course and to these topics are data-based environmental solutions and earth observation remote sensing. In case of remote sensing, we are working with different type of uh, platforms, starting from satellites, going down to airplane, uh, acquired data from airplanes, also drones, and also using quite a lot of uh, different uh, sensors on the ground. Um, if uh, talking about Sentinel data, there are some uh, points uh, what we can just kind of highlight. And uh, as already, those, those who are just, uh, I just under, understood you have like different experience uh, with Sentinel data. Maybe for those who are more experienced, it will be some kind of repetition of basics. But I believe that these are some points which is quite important uh, to point always, that there are two points of uh, Sentinel-2 data, basically, optical and radar. And if we compare it, I usually like to compare it with like, this one is like a very nice, colorful TV where you can get nice images and look at them. And this one is like a black, black uh, white TV with a lot of noise. But the difference is that uh, there, there is always, uh, that you will always have problem with uh, availability of useful data due to the clouds. And as we are living in the northern region, uh, the cloud problem is like, more and more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not important, but more frequent, uh, uh, frequently will appear. Uh, on, in case of Sentinel-1 data, on first view, it could, could look like as a really noisy data uh, with something like blinking and so on. But the main advantage is that you always will get this continuous data flow. At least these satellites are working in orbit. Uh, previously, Unfortunately, I should, I should say previously, uh, we had like six days repetition rate with two Sentinel-1 satellites. Currently, one is out of operation, and that means like now we are in this 12-day uh, repetition rate, but in future, I, I think soon, uh, we will again, we'll have this six-day repetition rate. In case of optical data, uh, the repetition rate is also similar, like five days. But what is also quite important to know that uh, uh, we are living in North, and uh, as all satellites are flying basically from, like, like in that direction, it means uh, there is like overlap of orbits. It means in each point, you can look at the data not only like from one orbit, but from several of them. For example, in, in case of uh, radar data, it's usually there are like data from four orbits are available, like to ascending, to descending. Basically, it means like 
from each orbit, you can get, okay, I would not say 12 days, there is some kind of difference like in, uh, in data acquisition rate, what appears, but basically it's, it's quite a lot of data. And the same uh, could be attributed to Sentinel-2 data. There is also overlap of the orbits, that's why we have even more higher frequency of data acquisition. On one hand, it is like a plus, but on the other hand, like you always should deal with uh, the clouds. And this is something what you cannot predict, and sh this should be taken into account, and th there is like usually like this decision to make, like what to do, like for example, if you have like free, uh, cloud-free image, of course, you can use it, but for example, when it comes to such kind of images, like are we going to use this part of image or, or, or not, and uh, we will look for cloud-free image, etc. Um, another aspect uh, when, when working with Sentinel data to uh, keep in mind that uh, there is this spatial resolution. If you look uh, in total like in Sentinel data, basically what you should know that I would say it's the state of the art of uh, freely available data. Basically, European Space Agency, I would say they are just dictating like what is the best data for free available. And basically those who are commercially providing data for them, there is no reason to provide something similar. You should go some, somewhere like more in advance. And basically, currently, if, if you're talking about freely available data, I would say like in, if, if you want to work with like all the spectral, the spectral can channels and radar data, I would say that resolution with, you, with what you will end up will be like 20 meters per pixel. This is what you can see with, in 20 meter per pixel, you cannot distinguish some kind of small objects, but for example, for relatively large or small scale uh, change detection, it could be accessible. Basically from this image, you can somehow say what's, what's where located. But also if, if the pixels are quite large, it means the information within these pixels is mixed. Basically it will be a mixture of different land cover types. Then, for example, 10 meters uh, pixels, and this is something what you can get from the Sentinel-2 optical, uh, like, like basically RGB bands and also one infrared band. It's usually enough for quite a lot of studies. Basically, this is something which is like, I would say, the best currently available data for free. And then, of course, if you want to go higher with some kind of uh, high resolution, like one meter or below one meter, then it's like uh, other like uh, commercial data from commercial satellites, uh, uh, airborne platforms, and etc. And uh, here is also some quick comparison. What means like one meter data, which is usually used when it's going like talking about higher resolution, and then it's like. 0.1 meter data, like what kind of uh, objects you can uh, distinguish. And of course, if you want further go to some kind of like really, really high resolution, I would say then, then it's a matter of drone. In this case, you can get like uh, pixel resolution be below like uh, one centimeter, like which counts maybe even like uh, in millimeter or something, something like this resolution. And then you can count flowers and then and, and plants, se separate plants, etc. Uh, not from space, but from air. And uh, and then uh, I w w was thinking like what kind of examples to put here uh, from our uh, previous experience, and I decided to just look at uh, one example which on which we were working. I think, yeah, it looks like five years ago. And uh, why I took it out, because um, we are usually are also going to this uh, uh, event, which, which is called like Living Planet Symposium, which is held like every th three years, like large conference, where you can get like an update on like what's going, hap what's happening around in Earth's observation field, like what are the new trends and what ev everyone is doing and uh, what uh, accuracies are reporting and so on. It, like quite interesting uh, thing what we noticed that uh, uh, there was event in uh, 2019 and then like it was time when uh, uh, satellites were in the orbit for a while and uh, it means that everyone had the chance to work with data, produce some kind of results and so on. Everyone was trying to uh, show some kind of results with uh, 
uh, with like higher accuracies and so on. And uh, this example is about like uh, agricultural lands classification on different crop types. And this is one of thematics, which is, I would say like top thematics for Sentinel data. Because if you look at the application of the Sentinel data in like basically case of land monitoring, I would say this agricultural field is the one where it's the most useful just because of uh, like, like radar C band. Uh, it is like it's it, it's uh, it's more useful for 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 agriculture rather than, for example, for forests or, or other other uh, land cover types. And uh, of course, uh, one of that's why uh, one of these like targets is this uh, just uh, cross check of 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 uh, of, uh, of agricultural uh, lands and so on. And uh, what we saw that uh, in 2019, everyone tried to uh, uh, report like accuracies, which is uh, like 95%, 98%, and so on. You're just think, think, looking at these accuracies like, whoa, this is something what we should reach, and so on. And uh, then uh, this year uh, conference, uh, uh, when there is like three years have passed, you can see that uh, the average accuracy is that people are reporting in the same field, like working on the same thematics, now is like around like 80%. Why it's so? It's just because time has passed. It's, uh, it's just my interpretation about like why we can see such kind of drop in accuracy. It's not because of like the weather was uh, not so good anymore, we had less data, etc. I would say that uh, it always depends on the scale of your experiment and what you, what you are testing. Like for example, it, like your algorithm will always work better on the local scale rather than larger scale. I suppose most of the studies just were based on larger scale, even like on, on country scale and so on. And in this case, you, your, your, your accuracy is not anymore. It's like 90 with something percent, etc. And then also, uh, which came, what we can see in the shift uh, in, in evaluation of the accuracy is that uh, the way how, how it's evaluated basically uh, also, also has shifted. And uh, I, I also think that it's uh, somehow related that uh, these developments, they went closer to the market. Basically, uh, those who three years ago were reporting 98%, they were not actually working with customers. But when, when you start to work with customers, the same like pay, paying agencies, yes, you can see like what is the real accuracy. And that's why it's very important from beginning, in my opinion, just to look quite critically on the result, what you can get. Look at uh, not only trying to get like the highest accuracy, but understanding also the limitations. Because Sentinel data, what I said, it's like, like really good. It's like basically the state of the art of uh, freely available data. But we also should understand that there are limitations. Limitations in, in data availability on, on what you can recognize from this data or classify or, or at all, what, what you can do. And that's why I just take, took this uh, example again, because it's Quite, quite interesting. When you, if you if you want to use uh, Sentinel data for classification task, I think it's like really good uh, good exercise to work on because in this case you can try, uh, try different strategies and uh, different combinations of data and look uh, how the results will go on and so on. Basically, this is a region of interest that we were uh, we were working on. We use like both like Sentinel two and Sentinel one radar data. These are the main crop types in this region, basically it's more like grassland uh, covered region, like around like 50% and there are some other crops. We just took some crops which are, you're pretty sure that these are crops uh, with some kind of, should be at least with some kind of significant uh, difference from the others. And uh, for, for the study, and it looks like something, maybe 10 or a little bit more of them. And uh, here it comes. Uh, let's look at uh, the accuracy, what you can get if you use optical data. What was interesting with optical data, this was 2017. And 2017 was like really bad year for optical data, at least in Latvia. Uh, if, you, if you would check the archive, you will have a lot of, a lot of cloudy, cloudy images. And I think that 
in, in case of Sentinel data, might be we should introduce something similar as, uh, for example, in, in this wine market, you always have this, like, this year was good for wine, this year was bad for wine, and so on. The same you can kind of uh, reflect to remote sensing data, air observation data, and 2017 wasn't very good for optical data because uh, if you look like, if you look at the region, at like cloud-free stands and so on, then you can find something in spring and something in late in, late in summer. And uh, basically, yeah, yeah, this is something which you already can understand, like, oh, it shouldn't like work out well if, 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 if it comes to like agricultural classification. And we already can see it like from, from, the, uh, from the accuracies over here. Uh, our goal was to reach like 85% accuracy per, 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 per crop type. And, uh, and what, what else? Uh, it's interesting always to look at uh, the errors, basically, where they go. And if we look, for example, at these crops like 111, which is like summer wheat, which is usually misclassified uh, with barley, summer crop, and also oats, also summer crop, and similar trends you can see with other crops. Basically, what you can see, if you would put together all summer crops and all winter crops, and also, for example, if you would uh, put together these like uh, permanent grasslands and cult uh, cultivated grasslands, you would uh, get like quite decent accuracy. It just because it just show you that uh, this data set isn't like enough for, for distinguishing between these like all these different type of crops, but it's still quite okay uh, to read information about which crop is like winter crop or summer crop and also uh, distinguish between crops and the grasslands. And uh, this accuracy would be very, very, very good together because uh, when you look uh, closer and trying to understand like what is like real difference between permanent grassland and cultivated grassland, actually in, in, in reality, it, there could be no difference. Basically, what you're trying to, uh, trying to do, you're trying to uh, classify two relatively similar classes, uh, just, just basically train an algorithm to classify, distinguish between classes where there might be no difference. Basically, this is something like, uh, by logics, goes, goes like wrong, wrong, wrong to do like this. But uh, okay, let's go further and check. Uh, in case of radar data, we also we tested, tested not only like one uh, orbit, but, but uh, two of them. Uh, and uh, what I also can say is that uh, it's not that uh, you can take like each of the orbit and the result will be the same. Basically, the, the result might differ depending on the orbit. Which is better? In this case, uh, this 160 orbit, which is a standing orbit. Sometimes you think that, okay, this orbit should perform better, but at the end it turns out that the other one is performing better. But this is also something to take into account that there are more than one orbit to work with, and there is always possibility to use one of them or to work with uh, like both or, or all of them. In some cases, there are even like four of them are available. But if you look at the accuracies, just using only, only Sentinel-1 data, and in this case, of course, we use like all available data set put together. And the accuracy is like significantly increased. Uh, some, some, in some cases, they are over, just were, were over this 85%. And for example, uh, rapeseed, these, these are crop types, which is like real, really, really well distinguishable from, from, from Sentinel-1 data. Uh, this one also, it looks like, but it's not just because it was distinguishable, but we can see the errors, like all the others were classified more and more as uh, as uh, barley and so on. And it's still like uh, look, looking at uh, grasslands, we can see the same picture. And here is the result, what happens when we put together, when we put together like optical data and uh, with, uh, with uh, radar data. And you can see that when we look at the accuracy, they significantly increase. In a lot of cases, they uh, just overreach uh, this uh, expected 85% accuracy. Still, in the case of grasslands, you cannot distinguish them. You just already mentioned why. And still, we can see that there is some kind of misclassification between, for example, this and these, which are 
all of them are summer crops and I believe that it's just because of the lack of uh, these uh, optical uh, uh, bands within the particular year. And uh, what happens when we combine these two classes into one, we can see that actual the accuracy goes up like to this. Like, but of, of course, I can I should mention that we should uh, look quite carefully at these accuracies, like uh, when performing uh, these tests and reporting them. But in this case, I wanted just to demonstrate like how how separately these data uh, sets work and uh, what could be the benefit while combining them. But in case of grasslands, what we can see is that most of the job is done by Sentinel-2 data and only like small kind of improvement uh, uh, is uh, introduced by adding uh, radar data because when looking separately, radar data is, is not performing so well if compared even to Sentinel-2 data, which is based only on two, two data stands, like from uh, spring and uh, late summer period. Basically, this is, this is always when you start to work with uh, Earth's observation data. These are experiments what, what you can go through, test like which data is better for your application because this is very important to understand, like lesson to take, I think, from, from this study is that uh, uh, each of the data sets can give some kind of uh, advantage to the result as we, as we saw, and it's very important to understand uh, looking, looking at these uh, experiments, like what exactly uh, each data set allows you to classify or recognize, and then putting together like uh, what, what is the uh, real, real uh, advantage of, of each of them. And this is uh, some kind of uh, visualization of this, uh, of this experiment. It's actually, it's, uh, from experiment which was like year before, but uh, basically what it shows it anymore doesn't show like where there was no like mismatch, but uh, this mismatch is demonstrated in form of uh, probability basically. And uh, what does it show over here that uh, this part was like declared as a, in reference data as a permanent grassland, but we already can see from reference data that it was plowed and it's more like this type of crop and basically that's why it was marked as an error and, uh, and it highlights. And uh, this is also an example about what I want to talk and I will, will, will talk quite a lot, that how we represent the result. Because in the representation of the result, there is always uh, two ways, it's at least in this uh, Earth's observation, basically. If you have a question about like if it, what kind of land cover it is, you can answer it as like, for example, it is like grassland or it's like it's not grass, basically one, zero, yes. But there is always possibility to provide your result in, in, in frames of probability or confidence, some kind and so on, some kind of uh, not like one, zero answer, but in, in, in uh, frames of, okay, this is like grassland with like probability, I don't know. 85% and so on. This is the result, uh, uh, how, this is the way how you present result and later I will uh, tell uh, why it is uh, so uh, important and uh, why it is important, for example, in this case, uh, within this study, um, during this Living Planet Symposium, there was also quite an interesting uh, story from, from one a uh, foreign uh, company which were working with their, their uh, national paying agency, they got uh, the result with accuracy which was around like maybe 80% on even, or even uh, lower. They were thinking, okay, like, like uh, it's not like really good result. But uh, then they approached uh, the customer and asked them, okay, in a standard manner, like, uh, uh, what, what is your capacity, like, uh, with, with how many cases you can deal? They said, okay, we, we can deal, like, uh, for, with uh, 5,000 cases per season. They said, okay. It means, like, uh, 
because uh, if you look in total, you, for example, you process like all countries, yes, you, you will get like, I don't know, like a million of some kind of uh, misclassifications and so on. Within them, there will be some kind of true misclassifications, which are related to some kind of violation, and there will be some kind of false positives and then set up. But in this case, what they did, uh, they just ranged all these uh, results, all these cases of, of, of misalignances, like with reference data and classification, according to the probability. And, and if you do so, usually if your algorithm is, is uh, logical and it's performing well, then on, on the top, there most probably will be like true misclassifications. And then just provided them like these 5,000 more significantly like, like visible uh, misalignments. And uh, what was the win-win story is that uh, this is the way how, how you can uh, cross the gap between there is always like user with its expert expectations about the result, about the, what, what they want from the data. And there, on the other hand, there is like data uh, result with the limitations, what you can reach. And if, if, you, if you ask me like about such cases, like what is like the real accuracy, what you can get from Sentinel data applica in application of agriculture, I don't know. I, I would say I have seen uh, reports three years ago going to 95 and up accuracy. And now I see reports going to 80% accuracy. I believe it goes like something like this. But I, I also believe that it's not like the true accuracy is not like 95 or up percent. It's somewhere maybe close to 90, what you can reach, and et cetera. But it's always, in, on one hand, of course, you can go for high accuracy. But on the other hand, it's always uh, important to understand like how this data can be used. And I believe that Sentinel data and these data products can be used for, for every uh, end user, but uh, their kind of compromise should be found. This is another, another example from, uh, from the same uh, activity project. Actually, we were working not on these uh, agricultural thematics. Actually, we were more interested in grasslands monitoring, and that's why the focus main was on glass, grassland classification, on grassland classification within the landscape, and also separation from, from other agricultural lands. And uh, here is an example uh, how you uh, can check for uh, management events in the grassland. In this case, we used uh, radar data uh, just because uh, we were interested in a higher frequency, the highest as possible. And radar data is quite useful for detection of plowing events, basically. Of course, if you, if you need like lower frequency, if you don't need like really high frequency in, in management, sometimes it's enough also using uh, optical data in such case. Uh, we also did a joint study with uh, Kappa Zeta. It's an Estonian company. There is one representative for Kappa Zeta, but he's not here in this room now. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a detection and management of activities like mowing. It's, uh, there is a mistake. And then plowing events um, uh, in, in grasslands uh, using uh, radar coherence data. Basically, the same what you did uh, yesterday. Uh, for uh, the same process, uh, you can get uh, coherence values and then also analyze uh, how they are related uh, to uh, some kind of changes uh, on the grass. Basically, if we look at the basics, uh, why, why we apply coherence processing so that um, vegetation usually has low coherence. If vegetation is higher, the coherence is usually lower. But when vegetation is like lowest person so on the coherence increases and it means that uh, after plowing you you can like you have like quite stable ground basically transparent uh, etc and the you, you can observe coherence increase but of course for for calculation of coherence you need uh, these two uh, uh, measurements uh, to compare per it and it means that uh, you will be able to detect uh, some kind of event only just after maybe event and then two, two measurements and, and cetera. But still for, for monitoring of if there some kind of management activity has happened or didn't happen in grassland, it is useful and uh, Kappa Zeta is, uh, yeah, they are expert in this field and they are also providing it as a service as far as I know 
uh, to Estonian uh, paying agency and uh, if, if someone from you are interested in this then I would encourage you to contact them they are experts in this field uh, what also we tried in this uh, activities um, which I, be, I, I think it's quite uh, challenging. We tried to map uh, invasive species, and uh, the only like official invasive species in Latvia is uh, giant hogweed, uh, Heraklum sosnowski. And uh, the territory where I'm from, where I'm an institute from, is uh, very well known with uh, uh, giant hogweed as almost the uh, crop type because you can find like fields 100% covered with uh, giant hogweed and this territory is like really good for such kind of studies. What we did, we just tried to, we, we performed tests like uh, how useful could be sentinel data for uh, uh, mapping of a giant hogweed spread and uh, the conclusions out of it, of course, this territory was like we are really favorable uh, for, for these demonstrations. That's why we reached this like high accuracy. But uh, the main challenge is in relation to giant hogweed particularly that, uh, of course, there is spectral difference, what you can detect and, and, uh, and, and rely on. But it's also the species, which is usually really, really intensively controlled and in different ways. It could be cut, it could be uh, fight with some kind of chemicals and so on. And it means at, at certain point it appears like <laughs> in different spectral colors because uh, if it has been controlled by some kind of chemicals, it starts to become like yellow, etc. And this makes it uh, more complicated in these cases. But uh, what what we what we saw for some kind of large spread of, of hogweed uh, sentinel data still could be applied uh, just looking at uh, particular specific uh, moments and uh, and uh, to track at least some kind of suspicious uh, areas there also you should expect that there will be uh, false positives with the plants which are similar to to this one uh, but uh, Still, uh, if, if you want to get like quick overview, like what is the change, for example, here's this territory, this is something which is like really affected and there were, there were like really dynamic changes. And at one, one year you can see that hogweed has been in this field and it's somewhere over there, somewhere over there and so on. Uh, we saw that for, for such cases, it's quite useful. And also the main limitation in using Earth observation data, you are looking from the top. And uh, this invasive species, it spreads around like roads and uh, river banks. And river banks, they are usually overgrown with trees. And what you cannot see, you cannot see through trees. And also there is minimum uh, uh, measurement unit what you can detect. Basically, what I, uh, I also want to say that it's more uh, related to some kind of control of like large fields, like if, if they have been infested, have been properly managed and on. For spread detection, I would say the different uh, spread, uh, basically modeling, different approach, in my opinion, should be used. Another thematics we have worked on, it's uh, of course related to uh, f forest monitoring. We have been, be, been involved in these activities. Here you can see result from yearly monitoring, which is sometimes uh, interesting for, for some end users. And uh, this is this can be done with uh, optical data because if, if, if you want to get some update on a uh, cover cover, uh, forest cover uh, on, on a yearly basis, yes, optical data is useful. Just just wait for full archive, use all optical data. In some cases, you can even do it like from, from one optical stain and so on. It depends on the case. But of course, if we, if we want to go towards like more higher frequency monitoring and start to use optical data, then uh, you look at the archive and use something like this typically. It's basically, yes, this is, this is like the nice part of optical data over Latvia. And uh, then you are thinking, okay, how I can use this for forest monitoring and so on, or for, for at least not only forest monitoring, but for, for higher frequency monitoring of like any kind of uh, land cover changes. 
And then you understand, yeah, it looks that we should try radar data because at least radar provides you with continuous data flow, etc. And this is example what you can get from radar data. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to make some kind of nice uh, pres presentation like how radar data in this case looks like and in comparison to optical data, but I will try to explain. Basically, you will now see like that something is painting on in this case. There is like date. We are just gen generating such kind of video just for analysis of each case. I just took one of them and here is some kind of information about this. The clear cut was done like 15th of uh, September. Basically, we're zooming into the, this is a digital uh, object model, basically, to see how large are trees and calculate this canopy cover, etc. Then we can see how this changes and when we detect a clear cut, basically. We started detecting it from here and then we just continue detecting it, it here, here, here. And it, it looks that uh, if you look at this uh, example, it looks that clear cut somehow starts on uh, like this 15th of September. It, it is started from here and then it goes like this and it takes approximately months to cut these trees and so on. But it's not, not, not the reality, what, what's in the reality. Basically, uh, this is how you can detect clear cut with radar data. But with radar data, you, you have like, uh, because with optical data, you will just uh, uh, see that there is like loss of vegetation, significant, etc. But with radar data, uh, it works differently. Basically, you look at the change in, in, in this radar signal, which is affected by mostly like surface roughness and so on. And in case of forests, uh, there, there are a lot of cases when uh, you can uh, miss the clear cut just because uh, the roughness, which is left after clear cut, some kind of simulates the same radar data, and it's still here. This is a good example, because some examples where you can detect only one part of it and so on. And it's quite, quite complicated, uh, but uh, yeah. On the one hand, in, for example, in this case, uh, for this particular part, you have radar data from four orbits, basically like different sites and so on, and you, you can combine it together and so on. There is like a plenty of uh, ideas what you can test and etc. But at the end, uh, when you go it through, you end up with such kind of graph uh, in this study, and you will end up uh, if, if we apply radar data, and I believe it's not, a, it's not applicable only to clear cut detection, but in different other change detection applications with radar data, because what, what it uh, demonstrates, this one is what you want to detect. Basically, in this case, I'm detecting like all 100%, and it's dropping, 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 but if I want to detect like all, and this one is like probability threshold, basically it's something what I already mentioned, because always you can get out of, of your model uh, some kind of, not only like one zero, it, is it clear cut or not clear cut, but with some kind of probability. Usually in standard, people are using like 0 0.5. It's, it's again like, it, it depends like how you can get to this uh, value and what, what you understand with probability, but uh, it, it's it's different matter. But for example, if you would, we would use 0, 0.5, it means we would uh, have this uh, detection accuracy like around 90% and, uh, and accuracy of, uh, what was the right name for this part of accuracy? Basically, the ones where have no clear cuts, basically negative, ah, uh, I'm just uh, trying to remember now. Basically another one which shows on the other high uh, how many false positives you have. This one shows, demonstrates false positives. It means uh, on the other hand, you, you will have detection accuracy something close to 90, but still you will have something like 50% false positives. In this case, number of false positives was like really large because clear cuts is, isn't something what's dominate in the forest landscape, and it means like for, for uh, some clear cuts, you get much more false positives. 
And of course, there is like uh, always like threshold what you can think through, like what could be probability, other things, how to tune. But I believe that in these cases, you always will be on this, uh, how to say, dilemma uh, between uh, how many uh, issues you want to detect and uh, how many false positives you would allow and so on. And uh, this is, yeah, this is again, it's uh, something what's uh, in, my, in my hand, uh, in my head, I, I think that uh, this is something what you cannot avoid. The next question is uh, uh, how uh, this could be acceptable and what, what is from this is acceptable to the end user. And it's again like how to make this bridge between like uh, the end user expectations and needs and what can be achieved from it. Like remember the uh, previous example. And in this case, yes, you, you always can say that, okay, I don't want to deal with uh, false positives. Okay, we will, we will not deal in this point, but it means uh, we will detect only like 70% of clear cuts. And it's always like a trade-off, like what actually do you want out of it? Another example is related from our uh, study with, 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 with uh, greenness mapping. Um, this is... Um, combination of, of uh, year-long NDVI data stick, uh, which we believe that really good for representation and quantification of greenness. And this one again is like combination of like uh, multiple year and DVA and uh, looking at trend. And what means uh, red part means like there is like increase in vegetation in greenness. Uh, red parts shows like some kind of decrease over these years. And this particular example is quite significant one. I think that uh, everyone knows it who is from Latvia. This is IKEA. They start to build uh, it uh, like, I don't know, in 16 or 17. No, 17, I think. And then also you can see how uh, that it, of course, it appears a significant decrease because previously there was like green area now there is like shopping mall and uh, parking lot and there is also some kind of nice relation how it has af affected like land surface temperature and created like new small heat island in uh, the city and uh, then also like interesting application like how you can apply this uh, parameter on on this some kind of units what what are usually people are interested in it for example in this case uh, cadastral units and assess greenness of uh, different cadastral units. But I think this one is even more po uh, interesting. This is, by the way, Boulder Eye, Venice, and uh, in Riga. And uh, these red ones are cadastral units uh, where uh, significant greenness uh, uh, decrease has been detected, basically. We are analyzing this trend and saying, oh, there's like really significant. And uh, then you can can check like what's happening like this one is like pretty nice one large one where there was like park and there was build a house okay nice and then was this one I like it looks like quite interesting that uh, this is small plot uh, where barely can get like some kind of several pixels in which I usually uh, have attracted to some kind of I always like to talk about that uh, you you don't want to deal with like border pixels and so on. You, you want you want to get rid of them because there is a, some kind of mixed information inside. But this is quite nice example, which kind of changed my mind because um, what we can see there was a tree, single tree, which was disappeared. But this uh, was detected by this approach, and it's it's quite nice uh, example which i believe just shows that even if you have sentinel data which is not capable to show you like visually that for example there is like a tree which is lost a single tree but still you can detect it but of course there are some kind of limitations if you think through like what could be combinations of of or causes of of, of three deaths and, and and so on but I also just checked like other other cases. This one, which already just also showed this, not anymore like black black and white, one and zero, is zero or not, not something, but it also shows like probability of negative changes. And here you can see these like high probability spots with red spots. 
and most of them are like uh, visually can be see that uh, something has changed and there is some kind of loss for example here you can see between like large buildings there is like one tree lo lost this one I think no this one it's not anymore here and uh, this one example also here, another just ran I randomly just take, okay, let's check this spot and this spot and uh, you are just surprisingly uh, for, uh, happy is that, oh, it has detected some kind of change and so on. Basically, it's, uh, it shows that, yeah, Sentinel-2 uh, data is uh, useful, for example, for, for control of uh, some kind of uh, units, like if, if there is something happening inside and what's even happening, and from spectral data you can uh, say like what kind of changes these are. At least uh, make some guess and then someone can go and check like for, for real cause and reason. Another application uh, uh, which we were involved, uh, in this case, uh, just uh, called our activity Sentilake. This is our project uh, in this already advertised program RPI uh, from, from ESA. Uh, in this project, currently we are uh, collaborating with uh, Latvian Environmental Meteorological Center. And uh, in partnership, we are developing this uh, service for uh, lake water quality monitoring. Uh, on one case, it might look uh, quite easy because what we are doing, you are just taking uh, lakes, looking at the water color and trying to interpret it from it like uh, the chlorophyll concentration and making some kind of levels, etc. Uh, but the hard part, I would say, it lies over here, this part, uh, because um, uh, if, if, we, if we use Sentinel-2 data, uh, and uh, for example, for land application, it's quite okay. But when it comes to water application, with water we, ha we get into different problems. Water has like relatively low reflectance. Basically everything that is from land reflects more light than water. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, in this case, you cannot apply standard atmospheric correction approaches, what you are usually using. Like, for example, you get data in SNAP, you are applying atmospheric correction and proceed processing it further. In this case, it, that will not work. You should, uh, you should look at proper atmospheric correction. Then, for example, you have find the proper atmospheric correction. There is another problem. As uh, water reflection is uh, very low, uh, there is influence from the neighbor pixels, basically from the coast. Because there are some, and it always depends on the size of the lake. For example, in case of Burtniaks, yeah, it, may, it might be not, not, not a problem, it's a relatively large lake, but when it comes to smaller lakes, then this pro problem appears like more and more and more. And this is something with what you should deal. Basically, to get from, uh, from color, to some kind of assessment of water quality isn't so easy. And there should be some kind of different tricks should be applied. But anyway, if you, for example, compare like uh, even from uh, Sentinel-2 data, like how many, how many observations we can get, yeah, I would say it's quite a decent number in comparison like with reference data amount which you can get by like uh, physically going and sampling. And there might be you will notice some kind of misalignment between what I spoke before and now. And here I'm stating that we can get like one up to four Sentinel-2 satellite data observations per month. But previously I just demonstrated to you like crop detection and I said there was no like uh, cloud-free Sentinel-2 data observations. Because in this case, we are not looking at like fully cloud-free CN. In this case, we are analyzing that cloud-free area should be over the lake. And there is also like some kind of threshold and decision, and in which case you decide that it's like, it's useful or not useful uh, data, uh, data scan. But if you go like in such manner, then I would say, yeah, this is something what you can expect uh, per month. And uh, this is another example from another lake, uh, the same, and how, for example, the spike also looks like in the color in the lake, like, like green stuff in the lake. Uh, another project where, where I will not go into, into technical details, but I want to mention like what we are working now on. Uh, this one is uh, 
uh, one of the last like PEX project program, which is previously RPI program. In this case, we are collaborating with Preferred by Nature, which is international certification organization. Uh, their interest uh, in this case was uh, uh, certification of uh, sustainable rice growing practice. And uh, to certify rice growers, there is need also for control mechanism. And uh, their interest was how we can improve the effectiveness of control mechanism by imply, implying uh, remote uh, sensing, basically, Earth's observation. And in this case, what we are trying to solve, uh, the problem uh, that uh, in standard manner, uh, uh, farmers in like, like in Asia, in this case in Vietnam, they don't care about like water usage. They just flood the fields. It's more safer for them not to lose the yield against uh, pests, etc. But this uh, sustainable practice relies on this, that fields are, are dried quite frequently just to reduce water usage. And this, uh, this practice could reach 30% uh, uh, reduction in water use and also approximately result in 50% reduction in uh, methane, methane emissions. It's basically, it means like not only friendly for nature, but also for climate. And in this case, yes, the main question is to understand like uh, what practice is uh, managed in the rice field. And there are also like different challenges about which, which I will not talk. It's not only about like detecting water and so on, but it's it's more complicating, uh, complicated task what we are working on. And this one also is uh, another uh, example of, of our new activities, uh, which is in collaboration with uh, state environmental service. And this is uh, first Latvian project uh, in program of future EO. We tried and we, we, got, we got this contract. And uh, what the idea of this project is, uh, is developed, uh, is develop approach for remote uh, monitoring of mining sites. It's, it doesn't mean that it will be fully uh, remote monitoring, but basically to get uh, useful information for inspectors uh, who currently are going uh, for, for checking the activities in mining sites. Uh, by, by on-site visits, but to get useful information that could be used for better planning of on-site visits and so they can go and already like check all, all the requirements. And we have, we have gone through the like, requirement list and now we are in the process of, of developing like first data products, evaluating it and etc. and going further into uh, finding the solution. Uh, which uh, fits both like the user needs and the possibilities of, uh, in this case, yes, uh, Sentinel uh, data. Okay, uh, this was quick, uh, quick, uh, uh, it was not quick, it was quite long, yeah? It was perfect, okay, thanks. I hope this presentation was interesting and you get something uh, useful out of it. And if you have any questions uh, or, 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 or want to talk, I will be there till the end of the day during coffee break. Feel free to come and ask anything. We are quite open also for collaboration if you, if you are interested in. Yeah. So what we propose to do now, because it's already Friday afternoon, is to split, um, to split instead of having one long break and then one longer block, to have a 15 minute break now, then we will have a short presentation of about half an hour. We can have another 10 minutes, 15 minute break, and then we, do, we go with the practical. Does that sound good? And then we can rest a bit more? Okay, so we do now the break until uh, 3.15, and then we're back with uh, the OpenEO platform and, uh, and the practical. <laughs>